All right, so these are your notes on community ecology, and then it's also going to be on populations. So to start, let's review what is a community. So a community, and you should already have this in your notes. If not, please write this down. So it's all the interacting populations of an area. So this is just living things. This isn't talking about other factors like water and rainfall and things like that. It's just the living things. But there can be limiting factors. So these limiting factors can be abiotic or biotic. If we remember, abiotic means living. Abiotic is non-living. So limiting factors in general, what they do is they restrict the numbers, reproduction, or distribution of organisms. So they restrict how many animals can survive in an environment. So these are things down here like sunlight, climate, temperature, water, nutrients, whether there's fire, if it's a grassland, your soil chemistry, living, the living things there, and then just the space in general that they occupy. So let's get into the population part. So population density is the number of organisms per unit. And this could be unit, it could be a centimeter, it could be a meter, it could be a kilometer, or... If you want to use it in other terms, it could be like a mile. So how many animals live in this area? So if you look at this graph here, the blue shows your lynx, which starts here, and the red shows your hare, and a hare is like a rabbit. So it's showing you the way the population moves based on the numbers. So in most cases, the hare, which is a natural prey species of the lynx, is directly affected by the lynx population. Then there's also something called spatial distribution. So this is the pattern or spacing. So if you look at our map, there's a key down here. So it shows you. So the highest populated areas are going to be this darker red color. So you see some spots in Florida. You see some spots in the west. So those are going to be your population changes or the highest percent change. Then you have your lowest percent, which are blue, so up in the Dakotas, you have some pretty low change, and then for the most part, most of the Midwest. So you need to look, be able to look at something and figure out how everything is distributed. So back to these limiting factors. So there's two categories of limiting factors. You have density independent, density dependent. As the name suggests, independent means that it does not depend, density does not depend on this factor. Dependent means it does. So let's get into those. So density independent factors, they do not depend on the number of animals. So it's something that will impact an area regardless of how many animals live there. So this is usually things like weather. So hurricane, tornado, flood, fire, human alterations, pollution, anything that doesn't rely on the number of animals is going to be a density independent factor. But then you have your dependent factors. So these do depend on the number of members. So these are things like competition or disease or parasites in a population. If you have tons and tons and tons of lynx, for example, back to that other graph, and not many hares, there's going to be a change in the population because competition is affecting the density of the population. So a look at comparing them. So density dependent factors are factors that depend on the population. So the amount of food available, the amount of water available, the amount of space. If there's a drought, there's going to be some problems because there's limited water. But the drought itself is density independent, but the resulting lack of water causes a density dependent issue. Then you have your density independent, which when you think of this, and if you have to give an example on a quiz or a test, just think of natural, natural disasters, or as this says, random occurrences, things that normally don't happen. So if there's a tsunami, that's a density independent factor. Then we have some growth rate information. So Population growth rate, or the shortcut PGR, is how fast a population grows. So the human population growth rate grows very quickly. Then you have a term called zero population growth, or ZPG. This is when birth rate equals death rate. So this is when things are pretty much equal. So birth rate, and just to kind of clarify down here for you, 
is the rate of birth in a population, death rate, the rate of death. Those should be two pretty self-explanatory terms. Then we have our exponential growth model. Hopefully some of these terms are review from math class. We'll go over some graphs in class, but you should be kind of familiar with this. So this is when the growth rate is proportional to the population size. This is definitely a vocab term that you should write down and define. So what happens is all populations grow exponentially until they hit a limiting factor. Then that limiting factor is going to slow the population growth. So something like a natural disaster is going to change the population growth. Something like the introduction of a new predator is going to change the population growth. So it slows or stops following exponential growth when it hits carrying capacity. And this term in general is called the logistic growth model. So carrying capacity, because this is another term, and honestly this whole term is the vocab and then this is the definition. So it's the maximum number of individuals in a species that the environment can support, really important here, long term. Not support for a week or two, support long term, have those animals be able to live and reproduce in the environment. So carrying capacity is limited by those factors like energy, water, oxygen, available nutrients. So let's look at a graph. So here you have the blue is kind of your carrying capacity line. So this is, in a nutshell, how many individuals that the environment can support of that animal. So if you notice here, we had an overshoot where the population spiked, but then look what happened. It dropped because the environment couldn't support it. But then it dropped below that carrying capacity, so it kind of went back up back down. Stay down for a while, shot up, goes back down. So it can go over and below the carrying capacity line, but when it does, there's going to be drastic changes because you have to be able to support enough species in the population. And then one other thing, two more vocab words for you, is types of strategists. So there's two types of strategists in an environment. There's an R strategist and a K strategist. So an R strategist, they are used to living in an unstable environment. They are usually really small, short lifespan, many offspring, lots of insects are this, or a really good example is bacteria. Bacteria are R strategists, and this is definitely something you have to know for a quiz. You're going to be asked an example, you have to be able to tell me. A K strategist, on the other hand, is used to living in a stable environment. It's a carrying capacity strategy. So they are usually larger. They have a long lifespan. They have few offspring. This is us. Or think even, if you want to think larger, something like an elephant. These are examples of case strategists. They usually only have one or two offspring, whereas bacteria produce lots and lots and lots, or some of your insects, or some of your smaller fish. Those are all going to be our strategists. And that's it.